appreciate your introduction. Uh, I acknowledge the presence of A.K. Das, sir, who is always inspires us, corrects us, and guides us. And after uh, Tripathi sir's lecture, which is like a high immersion field examination, my presentation might look like 10x. So please, apologies for that. I can't match him at, at any point of time. So let's look at my topic, the worsening album nuria, with what we can do. And this is going to be the agenda where epidemiology definition and management will look at. Basically, we know diabetes is the most common cause of CKD worldwide. And that is why we all should know basics about this in our routine clinical practice, because diabetes and CKD is increasing proportionately. And the, this is the prevalence in our country, which is about 34.4%. And that's something enormous, which is underdiagnosed. And that is where our role to look at to prevention of this uh, DKD is important. And this is the outcomes of patients with diabetes, as you can see. 90% of them would end up with a CV and 10% progress to the kidney failure. And this is a clear-cut association of UACR and EGFR with the cardiovascular mortality. And that is where the importance of EGFR and UACR comes into picture. You can see on the right-hand side the causes of death in diabetic patients. And this is where we can prevent because it is linearly associated with the complications. The survival of Diabetic patients who are on dialysis is definitely lower than other diseases and that is where it again very important for us to prevent this complication. And this is usually the natural history of any diabetic over a period of years as you can see there, the cellular injury, the mesangial expansion, all that you just learned from Tripathi sir right now and that is how it progresses from micro to macro and eventually to ESRD over a period of time. And this is where we can intervene in a primary or a primordial prevention also now. Now, what is this albumin to creatine ratio, UACR, for albumin? This is going to be for the assessment. It's a, it can be a simple spot test also, which is now recommended. Basically, it's a ratio between the two measured substances. When you do it in the lab, the urine albumin, urine creatinine. And UACR is a continuous variable. Remember that. And the term albuminuria describes all levels of urine albumin. And the term micro, we know 30 to 300 and macro is more than 300. Dipstick is, of course, recommended. And important, there is a significant variation within the individual. So you need to reconfirm with a second test before branding anybody with that. And DKD, you know the presentation, I mean the definition. It's a clinically persistently high urinary albumin to creatinine, that is UACR more than 30, and our sustained reduction in EGFR below 60. That's very important. And of course, screening, the features of atypical, you need to be aware about. The absence of retinopathy is something which differentiates most of the times that the, it is not a diabetic kidney disease. And that's something which you should do again, uh, uh, like a routine for most of our diabetics at least once a year. So this is the definition. We'll skip about this. The criteria for CKD, you should look at the markers of kidney damage for more than three months with one or more of these. That's the first one is your albuminuria, urinary sediments, electrolytes, other abnormalities. Abnormalities detected by histology and structural abnormalities by imaging or history of kidney transplantation fits into this. So the albuminuria is very, very important to know and establish the criteria for the CKD. And of course, EGFR less than 60. These are the risk factors for albuminuria, which all of us should know that most of them are modifiable risk factors. And that is where the onus is on us while treating our patients to maintain these and to keep diabetes, hypertension, and especially the smoking part and obesity now, which is gaining a lot of momentum. So lowering UACR, why should we lower? Because it may lower the risk of progression. That is not the only key. The part is just alluded in the previous presentation, but definitely it would help to slower the progression. And the basic components in our routine, busy clinical practice, you need to control your the patient's BP, sodium intake, achieve good control for that particular subject or the patient, reduce his weight, if obese, protein intake you need to look at, and tobacco cessation has definitely got a positive correlation. Now, in clinical practice, it's very difficult to differentiate the diabetic-related kidney disease because most of them is overlap presentation. You can see on the right-hand side, the normal albuminuric diabetic kidney disease with diabetes also can be seen, which is very difficult. So the overlap portion is what we see in most of the times, and the DKD part is, you can see, in the left-hand side. Now, based on the EGFR and albuminuria, again, albuminuria comes into picture in the classification staging. You can see the G1, G2 until G5 is based on the EGFR. And the persistent albuminuria categories, it's called A1, A2, A3. That is less than 30, 30 to 300, more than 300. So implications, why should we 
bother about this albuminuria reduction is obviously it's increased risk of complications increased risk of long term complications especially the micro vascular complications increased risk of kidney failure and need for dialysis patients eventually end up with that and of course the cv complications as i said earlier it's a direct correlation between the two and of course the another component with the ckd is the hypoglycemia incidence as you can see and it's associated with the ckd risk of various outcomes by egfr this is again very important just to show that the worst baseline egfr categorizes were associated with the high risk of cv complications and maze events so what can we do to retard this progression of ckd so we need to obviously look at the basic pathophysiological defect in this ckd and you need to counter this inflammation hyperglycemia and of course the hemodynamic dysregulation these are the drivers and we need to look at what are the available drugs in our routine clinical practice to look at this so let's quickly look at the management part as i said earlier intensive glucose control blood pressure lipids diet comorbidities and drugs targeting the progression individualized you need to look at and these are the other factors which you should look at so glycemic control of course way back in uk pds itself is clearly showed us the bad legacy effect which was again reemphasized by advance accord vadt all these trials have clearly shown the bad legacy will lead on to the complications so based on this this is the treatment treatment algorithm where for diabetics and ckd what you can do is the by the kidney icon indicates the estimated gfr there and the dialysis machine icon indicates the dialysis part that you can very clearly make out and the bottom most and you can see the metformin as gl2 i'll come a little later to this but which are the factors which decide a particular patient subjects hb1c targets you need to take all these into consideration and then take it further before deciding on whether you are going to keep a target of less than 6.5 or less than 8% it's again individualized some cautions when you look at the drugs in the background of ckd sulfonylurea insulins sglt2 pyo and insulin pyo combinations in people with the documented fluid retention risk of clinical benefits with the combinations of dpp4 and glp1 you need to look at now the other component is of course the blood pressure you can see the historical Uh, historical perspective of slowing progression associated with ckd over a period of time after the renal study with the ace inhibitors and there was no other drugs up to sglt2 for a, about a decade nothing came into picture for the rescue of this disease and this is the trends in age standardized rates just to show you the implications of diabetes related complications in the us adults you can see in the bottom most how they progress ras blockade again proven benefit this was the renal study after this the sglt2 only came into picture for about 10 years we never had anything to look at and this is the relationship between the mean arterial pressure and the rate of change of gfr and this is a very good flow chart the bp part you can see 140 90 16 start one agent albuminuria you check if it's yes start as and arb assess bp up to 4 4 weeks regularly and then not meeting target add agent complementary to the as or arb that is ccb or diuretics then assess bp adverse events this is how it's a very very simple uh, algorithm to take care about the bp management and this is one evidence to show chlorothaladen for hypertension in advanced ckd where 75% of the patients were diabetics in this study and this is the change in the blood pressure which saw just along chlorothaladen and these are all the guidelines which talk about the goals of bp in this which is again will be a complementary action uh, uh, helpful to control the complications of uh, progression so the sprint trial was one of the trials which targeted bp less than 120 all of us know and the intensive bp control did not prevent adverse kidney outcome so we say now do not bring down bp less than 120 70 so high rates of some adverse events were also observed in this intense treatment arm um, especially in the background of ckd SGLT2 inhibitors are the molecules I'm sure all of us are aware. We know the pleiotropic benefits of these drugs. This slide clearly covers literally all the SGLT2 trials with related to the PKD. You can see the renal endpoints with the credence, DAPA CKD, DAPA heart failure, emperor preserved, emperor reduced. All these are covered, and I was part of at least three trials in this uh, uh, chart. The heart failure and CV death. So this is something which now. the ckd and heart failure the prevalence of heart failure in ckd is about 11 to 15% prevalence of ckd in heart failure is about 50% and that's something all of you should remember most of these trials had patients as low as 15 ml egfr and they still worked and you know dapa ckd worked in non diabetics as well so the renal reduction in different trials for want of time i'll just trust these and this is where we saw very clear cut the findings from all these major cvot trials with the 
these SGLT2s, the relative risk reduction and kidney failure are independent of the baseline risk. And that's very, very important. So at whatever stage, you can initiate up to 20 ml uh, of EGFR. The absolute risk reduction in the risk of kidney failure is higher in clinical trials like credence and DAPA CKD that enroll patients with an established CKD and who are at high risk of kidney failure. Again, AKA and SGLT2 trials, you can see the two trials were compared. Overall, it does. And this is another important slide which talks about who should be offered the SGLT2s uh, as a first line and who should be, may be considered, not offered, may be considered for elderly and uh, peripheral artery disease, it is foot alteration, uh, I mean, sorry, ulcer ulceration, previous lower limb amputations, especially the canna, all that you need to be a little precautious when you initiate these drugs and who should not be prescribed Acute illness, DKA, excessive alcohol, eating habits, rapid progression to insulin within one year. These are the patients you should be careful about. I'm sure all of you are aware about these, but this is again a flow chart just to show the SGLT2 inhibitors, how do you initiate and what are the contraindications and the red boxes are seen. Sick day counseling has to be there. And how do you follow up? More than 30% increase in serum creatinine. That is there initially four to six weeks. Like Just like ACE inhibitors, the SGLT also shows initial dip and then they pick it up. No, no need to worry about that initial and this is the proposed algorithm for SGLT inhibitor uh, initiation. Now, just one slide to talk about the anti-diabetic drugs in DKD. You can see the red means is absolute contraindication. At the bottom, we have given the cutoff of EGFR. And you can see metformin. Insulin is one, which is across the spectrum. DPP force, you can see 45 to 30. This indication may be variable. Dose reduction is mostly seen, except the linagliptin. And of course, the SGLT2s, again, you can see that. And the GLP-1RA can be given up to 15 ml. That's one class of drugs which are now recommended. And of course, patients uncontrolled and multiple OODs, you will initiate on a simple basal insulin to start with. And then of course, individually, you can do that. Sick day rules for SGLT2s, all of us know. Now, this is another important slide which talks about, despite the RAS blockade, despite the SGLT2 inhibitors, the patients with diabetes and CKD still at high risk of CKD progression. You can see there in the credence, you can see the residual risk, which most of the trials do not talk about, and that's something is our worry. We need to still take care about this. So now we have one more drug, luckily, to look at this. That's the phenironone, which is a novel non-steroidal MRA. And this is a mechanical action, mode of action in the kidneys. And this is in the heart, where it is clearly shown beneficial. And this is the trial which showed the Fidelio DKD study, which clearly demonstrated. You can see the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. And of course, the category of patients. The EGFR part, you can see there, the 10% of the individuals were moderate and 80% of them were severe with respect to the albuminuria. More than 300 albuminuria were included in that albuminuria category and EGFR category also you can see. So the red boxes essentially, all the very high risk patients were included in this study. So this is the trial which included with a wide range of CKD and diabetics. That's the message which we see in our clinical practice as well. So this is the study design and look at the bottom most where Kidney composite endpoints were time to kidney failure, sustained EGFR of more than 40%, decrease in EGFR from baseline or a renal, a renal death. CV composite secondary endpoints were also there. The key secondary endpoints were four-point maze and as of course the other CV non-fatal, non-fatal MI and stroke. On the top of maximum tolerated RAS therapy, inner non significantly reduced the primary kidney outcome by 18% and the secondary CV outcomes by 14% in the background of standard of care and it has got a predictable impact on the serum potassium which we need to monitor and this is a very clear slide which talks about when do you start this phenylalanine and in the diabetic kidney disease initially you optimize the comorbidities other diseases bp lipid smoking then initiate the ras block then are sglt2 is contraindicated or not tolerated if yes then you initiate if the SGLT2, that segment I'm talking about on the left-hand side, you initiate the phenylalanine if GGFR is more than 25 ml, or albuminuria is more than 30, serum potassium should be less than 5, or consider GLP-1. That's another one which you can segment in that you can use it. And of course, phenylalanine significantly reduces the risk of more than 57% EGFR kidney composite outcome by 23% and had consistent significant effects on the outcomes, other outcomes. And this is another evidence which talks about the GLP-1 versus the DPP-4s. Very clearly, the GLP-1s are associated with the reduction in kidney and cardiovascular outcomes compared with the DPP-4s. And GLP-1s, the mechanism action, you can see 
I, I am sure all of you will remember now Kamala Kaur Tripathi sir when you say photosite loss and that is what he so eloquently uh, described about this and this is where your SGLT2s will minimize the tubular damage as well and the award 7 study that is the evidence just to show. So this is the 2022 Kedigo treatment algorithm for patients. After the lifestyle therapy, metformin can be used until 30 EGFR. Of course, you don't initiate, but less than for up to 45 ml, you can initiate also, but the, reduce the dose and discontinue if it drops below 30. SGLT2 up to 20 now, you can look at, do not initiate, but 30 and above you can maintain and somebody is already on, you can maintain it up to 30. After that, the GLP-1s, DPP-4s, insulins, ACUs, all that, guided by the patient preferences and other comorbidities associated with these patients and includes the patients with EGFR less than 30 also who are on dialysis, there are evidences now. And this is the ADA standards of care, which talks about the CKD and albuminuria again, which they are defined now as more than 200, and use of SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred regardless of baseline A1C, individualized A1C target, or metformin use. So very, very clear message. And in patients CKD without albuminuria, also it is there. Of course, that's not our part of interest today. So, preferably, you initiate SGLT2 inhibitors with the primary evidence of reducing the CKD progression or primary evidence of reducing CKD progression in the CVOTs or GLP-1s with proven CV benefits. And that is very, very clear now, recommendations-wise. So, this is compared to placebo. The patients treated with DAPA had a lower rates of deterioration in categorically UACR compared to placebo. This is just to show the progression, how you can. And this is a regression where from macro to microalbuminuria, Again, patients treated with DAPA had higher rates of improvement in the categorical UACR compared to the placebo harm. Now, these are some of the disappointing clinical trials with respect to the CKD, just to keep you updated. And the possible combination therapies in routine clinical practice, you look at the SGLT2 GLP1s, SGLT2s MRAs, I showed you that flowchart. And this talks about again the screen EGFR and UACR, at least annually as per the ADA guidelines. And if EGS are less than 60, or UACR more than 30, recheck within three months, increased albuminuria that is persistent beyond 30 after three months, start ASR ERBs. That's the key, the four pillars now we know. And this is where you run about. And the goals, other goals, as I said, HB1C, the modification of risk factors, that is smoking, weight reduction, detect and manage other complications like anemia, which is again one of the commonly underdiagnosed in the background of CKD, attributing to the CKD. You need to maintain below 11, 10.5%. Do not increase it. Uh, beyond that, because there are uh, uh, a risk of deaths associated with the mortality is more when your uh, hemoglobin is more than 11.5, especially in the background of CKD. You look at the CKD, the mineral bone density, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, a balanced approach to nutrition in CKD, you need to take the help of specialists in, whenever required. And this is something which is coming up, the co-management models, which are a collaborative care uh, with the care coordinators and the clinical decisions to support and the development of treatment protocols. And of course, the when should you refer the patient until about 30 ml you can as a primary care physician still manage because most of us get scared when EGFR drops below 60 you need to look at the common risk factors common mistakes what we have done with respect to the medication errors the electrolytes the miscellaneous drugs and of course what are the patients underwent the diagnosis many of them had a bad lab history the lab you need to repeat and recheck as I said so to summarize, the diabetic kidney disease is a growing public health concern. Screening is the key to prevent and postpone the complications. Glycemic control and the blood pressure control, especially with the RAS blockade, and is very, very important. And these SGLT2s definitely plays an important role. MRA is an emerging therapy for this. Thank you very much for patient hearing, sir.